All right, welcome back to Heritage University. And uh, this week's session is going to be on Bible translations and using our English Bible. Uh, last week we talked about uh, the canon of Scripture, uh, what books were included in the Christian canon and why, as well as the uh, textual veracity of, uh, of our translations, and, and particularly the texts that are used for those translations, both in the Old and New Testament. So we talked last week about uh, the canonical Scriptures as well as text criticism. Uh, but what we didn't have time to do was get into translations, and so I decided to go ahead and lengthen this into a full session to talk a little bit about uh, where the English translation of the Bible came from and, uh, and how modern English translations uh, uh, approach the, the subject of translation itself. And so uh, hopefully some of these things will become clear, but I wanted to start uh, with kind of a, a brief history of the English translation of the Bible. Now, uh, we're going to start with an obvious observation. Now, this slide is about John Wycliffe, who is very uh, important in terms of beginning the process of translating the Scriptures into English. But we're going to start with a, a basic observation that you already know, but it's worth repeating. The Scriptures were not given to us in English. They were given to us in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And so the question becomes, how did those original texts... Uh, come to be translated in the English vernacular. Now, there's a, a long history here, and I want to uh, recommend a book to you called How We Got the Bible by uh, Timothy Paul Jones. It's a very accessible guide to, uh, to many things about the Bible, including the canon and text criticism and uh, translation issues, uh, but it also gives a good backstory of the history of English translations. I would recommend it. It's a very good accessible source. And then, of course, uh, 40 questions about interpreting the Bible, as well as... Uh, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation, our other two textbooks, they're very good about this as well. Uh, but uh, it was about 1328, and these dates are all give or take, we don't know exactly, but it was about 1328 that John Wycliffe was born, and at this time, uh, the scriptures were not translated into the vernacular of the people, in this case the English people, uh, but the ecclesiastical authorities, and particularly the church, they uh, preserved the scriptures in Latin, but they didn't translate it into the language of the common people. Now, John Wycliffe was a, a very brilliant English priest, um, and he had the radical idea at the time that it would be better for the people to have the Bible in their own language rather than going to Mass or going to church and hearing the Bible read in Latin and hearing, uh, hearing the entire service in Latin. He said, no, there need to be preachers who are t telling people the truth of the gospel in their own language, uh, and they need to have the scriptures that they can read for themselves. Again, for us, this is common, uh, common and it, it, of course this is what we would think, but it was a radical idea at the time. And so uh, John Wycliffe, who was Oxford educated, he was a, a very prominent theologian, he was a linguist, uh, but also had this radical idea. He began to lead a group of poor, uneducated preachers known as the Lollards. Now, we don't know exactly what Lollards mean. We know it was a, a derogatory label for these uneducated preachers, uh, but they began sharing the Word of God in English, and there were at least excerpts of the New Testament that were written in the vernacular of the people for the very first time. And you can imagine this. I mean, there were Christians uh, throughout England at this point, but you can imagine uh, the fire that was lit in them as they heard the Word of God in their own tongue for the first time. No longer was it in a language they couldn't understand or a language that seemed inaccessible to them, but they got to hear about the love of God, the grace of God, uh, the sacrifice of Christ in their own tongue. And of course, uh, it's hard to overestimate the impact that that would have had. Just like even today, as, as the Bible continues to be translated in many languages, there's a difference in hearing it in your own language. Uh, and so these Lollards, they began to spread the word of God. The ecclesiastical authorities, of course, didn't like this. Uh, but during John Wycliffe's lifetime, they basically let him do it. Uh, you know, he was basically kind of censured for this, but he wasn't excommunicated. However, 30 years after his death, so they were thinking early 1400s here, uh, at the Council of Constance, he was condemned. His body was exhumed, which means that his body was uh, unburied, and he was burned at the stake as a heretic. Now, I've got to say, if you're going to be burned as a heretic, I'd much rather uh, it happen 30 years after my death than while I'm living. Uh, but in any case, uh, his ideas were seen as so radical that the church condemned him, as well as a, a man named Jan Hus, uh, who was 
promoting these radical ideas of the language in the vernacular of the people. Now, uh, John Wycliffe is sometimes known as the morning star of the Reformation, meaning that some of his ideas uh, were revolutionary for their time, but they gave rise to the same kinds of ideas later, both in terms of the language of the Bible being the vernacular of the people, but also in terms of, of this idea of the Bible in people's hands, the Bible as the sole authority of faith and practice. John Wycliffe uh, didn't necessarily have those ideas fully developed, but he was known as the morning star as in indicating what was to come. Now, as the story continues, uh, we have uh, the Vulgate, Greek, and Erasmus. And so as time goes on, so this is uh, you know, about 75 or 80 years after the death of Wycliffe, once you unleash this idea of giving the Bible to the people, uh, it really catches on. And of course, uh, during this Renaissance period, there was a, a great interest in going back to the sources. Ad fontes was uh, the, the kind of rallying cry of the Renaissance, go back to the sources rather than uh, relying on kind of the received traditions such as the Latin Vulgate that had been kind of fashionable for about a thousand years at this point. So this man named Erasmus was a Renaissance scholar, very much respected, and he was the first to publish the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament alongside the Latin text. Now, uh, he actually was seeking to produce a new uh, version of uh, the Latin scriptures, uh, but in order to show the accuracy of his Latin version, he chose to actually include the Greek manuscripts, and, and here we have uh, the Gospel of John, we've got the first chapter in Greek on the left side, and on the right side is his translation into Latin. Now again, his point was to show his Latin translation was very good, but he included the Greek manuscripts for the first time. Now why is that important? Well, it's because all of a sudden, he gave access to these original manuscripts to the masses, or at least the, the scholarly community at this point, and they could see there was an advantage to, instead of translating something from Greek to Latin and then to a receptor or target language, they could go uh, and skip the middleman. No longer did they need Latin, and all of a sudden, the Latin text, which again had been sort of the primary text, the Vulgate, uh, it no longer had the same level of freshness and authority that it had, it had held for about a thousand years. So, up to this point, uh, English translations had been produced using the Vulgate, a Latin interpretation, and that actually should be a translation, I'm um, sorry for that, Latin translation of the scriptures. Uh, by, but by including the Greek manuscripts alongside the Latin, Erasmus really helped to foster interest in the Greek uh, and translation into new languages that didn't have yet have the Bible in their target language. So Erasmus was a very key figure, uh, both in the uh, Renaissance itself, but especially in uh, the propagation of the Bible into various languages and the practice of text criticism, which is compiling the uh, best available manuscripts and studying them to determine what the original said. Over time, Erasmus produced different editions of uh, the Greek New Testament, uh, and he got better at it over time. Now, uh, the next person that we want to talk about is William Tyndale. Okay, so he's a contemporary of Erasmus, and uh, he, he was one who, in the spirit of Wycliffe, uh, really truly believed that the common man, uh, rich or poor, young or old, educated or uneducated, anyone who would be able to read should have the Bible in their own language, particularly for him, into English. And so William Tyndale was a, a very learned man, uh, and he had a passion to translate the Bible into English. Now again, this was frowned upon because, after all, to release it to the masses, the, the ecclesiastical authorities said the masses would misunderstand, the masses would misuse the scripture, or they might begin to disagree with what the church taught uh, in terms of what the scriptures, uh, what the scriptures, uh, what should be believed. So William Tyndale comes along and he translates the New Testament into English. It's very controversial. In fact, he had to leave the country in order to do it because it was illegal. But uh, even as he did it, he used the Greek manuscripts that were provided by Erasmus in Erasmus's critical edition. Now, uh, this was, again, 
the, the first time that the entire New Testament had been translated into English. Portions of it had been, but William Tyndale wanted to do it systematically so that he could put the entire New Testament, and then later he didn't finish the Old Testament, but portions of the Old Testament into English. Uh, and in doing so, this was an incredible literary work, it was an incredible scholarly work, but he coined some different terms such as fisherman, seashore, scapegoat. In fact, this is true today, when translating the Bible into another language, uh, a translator has to make decisions as to some of those words that might not have a one-to-one -one correlation in a, in a target language. Um, so he coined them. In fact, uh, as we think about William Tyndale, his impact on the English language as a whole uh, is very, very important. It was very influential. Um, William Tyndale, in fact, uh, he, as he translated the scriptures, he would send them to England. Uh, people would read them, but the church authorities didn't like that they, people had the Bible in their own language, so they began to buy them up, sometimes paying very expensive prices, and uh, some of that story is told in, in how we got the Bible. But uh, as the church paid for these, the money eventually got back to William Tyndale, and he just used it to, what, publish more. And of course, you, you probably know this was the time when the printing press really came into full force, and so uh, they really couldn't put it back in the bottle. Once people had the Bible in their own language, they were hungry for it, as you can imagine. Uh, his famous last words as he was burned at the stake um, were, God opened the eyes of the King of England. And, uh, and lo and behold, that's what happened very quickly after his death. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is the King James Version of the Bible. And now there are several versions. So think about 1830s, William Tyndale is, is uh, work, or I'm sorry, uh, John Wycliffe is working on translations or at least facilitating that uh, in, the, in the late 1300s. You think, uh, again, with William Tyndale, you've got him working early 1500s uh, on a translation of the New Testament. There are several Bibles in between that kind of 1520s, 1530s translation of Tyndale and the 1611 King James. We're going to talk about those uh, kind of uh, those transitional Bibles in a moment. But I want to talk about the King James in part because uh, this is this is uh, one of the most uh, one of the most popular translations of the the Bible in English speaking history. So, the King James version. It was published in 1611 and it was authorized by King James in order to provide one Bible for, for all churches in England. Now, remember, William Tyndale prayed, God opened the eyes of the King of England. Very quickly after his death, the King of England did take what was essentially a version of Tyndale's Bible, and he mandated, I mean, think of the flip-flop here, they went from no Bible in the English language to then requiring the Bible in every single church in England. But here's what happened over the course of that 90 years or so is that there were a couple of different Bibles in English that the different churches had. And so there were a group of Puritans as King James, who was originally king in Scotland, as, as he came over to become uh, king in England, there were a group of Puritans who came to him and they, uh, they had a number of requests, but one of them was, can you please authorize, which is why the, the King James Version is also called the Authorized Version, can you authorize a single version of the Bible that, of course, they would be happy to help him produce, uh, can you authorize this so that we have one uniform Bible in all the churches in England? Again, most churches in England had one of two different translations, but they wanted to have one authorized version. Uh, King James said yes, uh, partly because one of the versions uh, had some things in it that he thought were anti-monarchial. -monarch -mon and so he authorized this version, and the translation committees followed uh, Erasmus's versions of the Greek, um, as well as using a, uh, an English translation of the Bible that was really a progeny or um, a descendant of Tyndale's original translations. So the King James Version follows in large part Tyndale's translation, it uses the Greek manuscripts as preserved by Erasmus, and again, over time, uh, these, these were stronger in terms of Erasmus's critical edition even becoming greater. Uh, but even as we think about the 1611 King James Version, uh, it was in what to us seems like kind of an old-style English. In fact, some of the spelling, uh, you see there the, the language of son, S-O-N-N-E, rather than our S-O-N, or some of the old spelling where you have V's replaced with U's. Uh, the King James Version originally was in an English that is, of course, uh, very similar to ours, but feels a little bit different. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the King James in a moment, but I want to walk through the transition between 
uh, William Tyndale's translation of the King James. So here are some just dates of early English translations. Of course, we start in the 1380s with Wycliffe. We, uh, we move on to Tyndale's translation that comes out uh, in uh, the early 1500s, but very soon after Tyndale, you have the Coverdale Bible, which was derived mostly from Tyndale's translation. You have the Matthew version, which essentially was Tyndale's translation with a different name. You had what's known as the Great Bible that was based on Matthew's version, which was based on what? Tyndale's translation, that copies of it were placed in every church in England. You eventually have the Geneva Bible, which was based on the Great Bible and Tyndale. Um, and so here's what you see, that, that Tyndale's early translation uh, became very influential as the, as the English Bible continu continued to be translated into different versions. And again, even the 1611 King James Version was highly influenced by Tyndale's original translation. Uh, which, as, as we stop and think about that for a moment, uh, it really makes sense, doesn't it? I, I mean, once you hear, uh, and for a lot of us, we probably grew up hearing a lot of uh, the 1611 King James, or at least a, a later version, maybe, you know, later... Um, later editions of the King James. But think about it. Um, if you hear something like Psalm 23, the Lord, is, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in path of righteousness for his namesake. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You, you hear these things, and once, once you have an idea, once you have it ringing in your ears, uh, subconsciously even, that will continue to influence how you think about uh, the translation before you. And so here's, here's what I just want to say. Some people want to argue that the King James Version, especially the 1611, is maybe a re-inspired version or it somehow uh, epitomizes or is even a God-given version of what the English translation would be. And, and for some, they know this, but for others, they don't even realize that the King James Version wasn't the first version in English. Uh, it was highly influenced by other versions as well. And, uh, and as we talked about last week, even in, in text critical considerations, although, uh, although there were very good Greek manuscripts that were used to translate the King James, uh, now in modern translations we have more manuscripts, in some cases older and better manuscripts, that help to sharpen what was a very good translation and, and make it better or in some cases to start over fresh and to seek to have a, a brand new translation of the scriptures that stays true to the original Greek and, and Hebrew manuscripts. In other words, uh, from an academic critical standpoint, uh, and by that I mean considering the best academic resources we have, we can say the 1611 King James is a great translation of the Bible, um, and, and it's been incredibly influential. That's undeniable in the history of the English language. But uh, modern translations uh, do base their translations on better and older manuscripts, and therefore we can appreciate the King James, but there, there really isn't a reason to think that somehow uh, it has an uh, inspired uh, aura to it that we have to respect simply because it was the most influential Bible uh, in terms of the, English, the history of the English language. Now, that's just to give some background uh, background information about how the English translations came into being. And by the way, we have so much uh, uh, we have so much gratitude for all of the work. I mean, don't forget, men literally gave their lives. Think of Wycliffe. Think of William Tyndale. Gave their life so that we could have the Bible in English, and we're so spoiled. But as we think about English translations, there are some principles that we need to remember. Every translation, and this is true whether it's the Bible or not, every translation involves decisions on the part of the translator. Um, you have to, as a translator, figure out how to, how to best communicate the text from the original language to the target language or to the receptor language. That involves choices. Some idioms in one language might not exist in the other. The word order of one language might not be the word order of the other. Uh, th there are all kinds of decisions that go into it, so uh, we just have to be aware of that up front. It's, it's not a fault. It's just a necessary truth of translations. And as we think about that, modern English translations usually fall in a spectrum of dynamic equivalence, which would be what we would call thought for thought to formal equivalence or word for word. Now, if that doesn't make sense, we're going to uh, explain it a little bit further right here. So, because we have to make decisions in translations, uh, different versions, different translations, will seek to use 
basically a different philosophy of translation. And this isn't to say that one is right or wrong, but depending on what they're wanting to do, uh, depending on the audience they want to reach, depending on, uh, depending on a number of factors, some translations prefer word to word, thought to thought, or uh, in some cases even paraphrase, and we're going to break that down. So word for word translations basically say, okay, when we're making the decision of how to translate a text, we are going to try to stick to a one-to-one, word-to-word correlation between one language and the other. And so uh, it, this basically means that they are going to say this word in Greek or Hebrew, we are going to translate this word in English every single time. We're going to try to do it consistently. We're going to try to keep the same word uh, in 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 it. Uh, in a very rigid way. And you might think, well, of course, why, why wouldn't you do that? Well, here's, here's, uh, here's one of the reasons why at times that might not be preferable. So think, for instance, of, uh, of a word that might have, uh, have many synonyms or one word that could be translated with maybe two or three words um, uh, in, in, a, in a receptor language. Well, if you use the exact same word one for one in a context where maybe there's a different nuance of the word, then by preserving a one-to-one -one correlation, you may actually obscure the particular nuance that, that should be uh, brought out in a receptor language. In other words, word-for-word -word translations, sometimes they work great, but there are certain instances where maybe the author is using that word in an idiomatic way. So here's, here's uh, one of my favorite examples. In Hebrew, the expression uh, that God is slow to anger is the expression long of nose. Literally, the, the words in Hebrew are God is long of nose. Well, in English, uh, many translations choose to, to render that God is slow to anger. Why? Because they know in Hebrew, it's an idiom. It's a, it's a way of saying that God is slow to anger. And the, and the word picture behind there is when someone gets angry and especially full of anger, uh, the tip of their nose might be the last place that that kind of blood rush of anger reaches. In other words, to say that God is long of nose is to say it takes a long time for the anger to fully consume God to the point where he pours it out. He's slow to anger. He's patient um, and doesn't easily pour out his wrath. He gives many opportunities for repentance before he renders final judgment. It's an idiom in Hebrew to say long of nose, but if you translated long of nose into English, it would make no sense. And so the translators have to make decisions uh, will we render this something that's intelligible in English? And so they say, oh, we'll change it to God is slow to anger. That's an example of how word-for-word -word translations may not work. Um, so thought-for-thought -thought translations. Moving on, a thought-for-thought -thought translation says, okay, one-to-one -one correlation between words may be a good goal, but a better goal, they would say, is trying to get the essence of one thought, say in a full sentence, and translate it into a full thought in another sentence. So rather than doing rigid, this word means this word in, in a target language, they say, let's just take the full thought and try to make sure we accurately convey the thought um, in a sentence. In, in other words, they're not going to be concerned to say every single time this word occurs in Hebrew or Greek, we're going to translate it exactly with the same word in English. No, they would say, as long as we capture the essence of the thought, we'll be fine. Uh, examples of word-for-word -word would be NASB and ESV. Those are kind of the most popular ones. Examples of thought-for-thought -thought would be something like NET or maybe NIV. Uh, and then finally, you have paraphrases, which some are translations, but many of them really aren't. Uh, many of them are just trying to adapt the thoughts of Scripture to modern language using modern vernacular, and basically it's more of an, art, an, an artistic goal, but really a goal to try to uh, make the, script, the Scriptures as accessible as possible to people who maybe aren't familiar with, uh, with uh, you know, the scriptural language. They want to basically invite people into the Scriptures by making it as accessible as possible, and of course they're seeking more of the thought-for-thought -thought mentality as well, not worried about one-to-one -one correlation of words. As we think about this, here's, here's some examples of John 1.14 in various versions. First, we've got this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the CSB. This is uh, somewhere along the spectrum, really more toward uh, word for word, um, but still has a thought for thought kind of feel to it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the CSB. The message, which is more of a paraphrase, it, it 
takes more liberties in terms of, of interpreting what this means. So instead of the word of God dwelt among us, it says the word moved into the neighborhood. And instead of God as the one and only son, he is the one of a kind glory like father, like son. They, they uh, take some liberties there to try and expressively uh, help us understand what it means. From the father full of grace and truth, inside and out, true from start to finish. Uh, so you see there the difference in translation philosophy. King James, going to be very similar to the CSB, but a little bit different. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten. So there's that, that word, only begotten. Um, and that has some uh, particip particular theological heritage to it as to why they chose to translate it that way. But that's one difference between that and a modern translation. Uh, ESV here, it's going to be very similar to the King James because it was kind of a, an outgrowth or at least a, a, a long descendant of the King James, the ESV is. But the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, just some different thought process in translating it. Some, like the ESV, very much more word for word. CSB is going to be more word for word, but less word for word than the ESV and a little bit more dynamic, at least on that spectrum. Message is going to be far into the paraphrase of the spectrum and KJV is going to be a strong translation as well. Just want to give you some examples of the different translation philosophies in practice. Now, I want us to do just a, a brief thought experiment and you to ask yourself the question. You can pause right here as you think about it. If you were to produce your own translation of the Bible, what translation philosophy would you use? Um, there might be different answers to this. It might be different if you were uh, translating the Bible for, say, a six-year-old. Would you use a different translation philosophy? Maybe more word-for-word -word to make it understandable. Uh, or if you were doing a Bible study, maybe you would use a more word-for-word -word to help you understand and point you back to the original languages. But let me, let, let me uh, as you think about that, in what ways would previous translations affect your translation? And this is a little bit of a trick question, but here's what I'm trying to kind of pull out with this, is that, that principle, that insight that we talked about earlier, that once you have heard or once you have read something in one translation, it will inevitably affect the way you think about future translations. In other words, you can't get away from it. You might try to produce a truly fresh translation, and your translation may end up being fresh, but inevitably you're going to have something already to compare it to mentally in your mind, which is why, as we think about the history of translations, former translations like Tyndale's, like the King James, like the NIV, like whatever translation you grew up memorizing scripture in, if you memorize scripture, you can't not know those translations anymore. They will inevitably affect the way you think about the Bible. And why is that important? Well, it's just important to know that we don't, even, even when you're translating it from the original languages, you're never truly going to approach, uh, approach translation from a clean slate if you've already read the scriptures. It's really impossible to do that. Um, and we can do a better or worse job of that, but it's, it's just worth knowing from a translation perspective what we have already understood the text to say will impact the way that we read it. Again, that doesn't mean it's determinative, but we have to be honest about what we already know and how it impacts the way we see it in the future. Um, so which translation is best? Sometimes people ask this, and it really depends, at least in my opinion. Uh, are you doing uh, your personal devotions? Well, maybe something like the NLT. It's a very popular version because it's, it's expressive, but also uh, it, it stays very close to the text. It might be a great version for devotions, or, or maybe the NIV is something that's very clear readable, usable. Uh, these are great Bibles. Uh, but what about for Bible study? You know, for me, I would not use the NLT for a Bible study. Why? Because it doesn't seek to preserve that kind of one-to-one, word-to-word -one, -word correlation, even though at times that's impossible. Uh, at times it's very valuable. So I prefer uh, for personal study or if I'm studying the Bible, uh, I prefer to do the original languages. But if that's not possible, uh, you can use the NASB, you can use the ESV, um, or others that, that really help you and point you back to the original languages, um, and, and those, those are good for those purposes. But also think about this. It, it totally depends on your reading ability. I, I would not, as much as I appreciate the King James, I would not give that to my four-year-old who's just learning to read. Why? Because that might create a sense uh, that the Bible is inaccessible, or that the Bible is unreadable. 
I want, uh, I want my kids to love reading the Bible, and so uh, I'm willing to give them a translation that may not you know, make it in academic circles. It might not be cited in academic articles, but if it creates in them a love for the Scriptures, uh, that's what we're after. So depending on what your purpose is, uh, we are so blessed. And again, we, we have to remember and appreciate we are so blessed uh, to have many good English translations to use all of them uh, for different purposes, but we praise God for that, and, and we should be truly grateful. Now, in closing, I want to offer just a few study helps, study tips for using your Bible. One is this, and, and sometimes people notice this, and, and it's not as common with, with newer versions, but especially like the NASB, uh, we have to remember that words that are italicized are not in the original text, but are supplied for clarity. So, uh, for instance, there's uh, this kind of famous example in Ephesians 5, uh, you look at verse um, 21 especially, it says this, this is, uh, again, and I love this, this is, this is a good example of uh, keeping word for word or even kind of the, the flow of thought. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 really form one long sentence, okay? And as they do, and that's why, by the way, you've got all these semicolons and other things that the, the translators are trying to show you, this is all connected. You can't separate um, you can't separate verse 18 from verse 21, and you've got here an imperative, be filled with the Spirit that really governs uh, everything else that follows. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It means speaking to one another, singing and making melody, giving thanks, and all under the command of be filled with the Spirit, and subject yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, interestingly, the next verse is translated, wives, submit or subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, here's the thing. This, this verb, subject yourselves, this command, that doesn't actually occur in verse 22. It's actually a drop down from verse 21. Uh, so if you were to look in the original Greek, you would not see the imperative, wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands. It would be wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Well, in the Greek language, the, it, it's not that that command is wrong or that that command somehow is uh, is misused or misapplied. No, the, the point is uh, that the command literally uh, is intended to be repeated from verse 21. So the understanding is the same command that applies in verse 21, subject yourselves to one another, also pertains in verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves or subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. This happens in Greek uh, where one verb is not explicitly stated in a later text, but it is presumed or assumed to continue from a prior text, which is why the translators rightly say, obviously, the idea of subjecting ourselves continues in verse 22, which is why they supply it. But you notice, uh, in terms of the translation, it's in italics. Well, why is it in italics? Is it because, you know, there's an asterisk or there's some question about it? No, that's not the point. The italics basically are saying this was not in the original manuscript, we have supplied it from the verb that's not in the italics up top. We have supplied it because it's obviously meant to be implied, but we want you to know uh, what we've done, so we've indicated it in italics. Just want you to know, if you're reading through your Bible and you say, well, why is this word in italics? It's because the translators have supplied it for clarity reasons uh, in ways that are keeping with uh, the, the language that they've translated it from. So, if you're wondering why those are in italics, that's what it is, and it's just to help you know uh, how they translate it and why. Next, uh, and, and I can't overemphasize this, acquire a good study Bible, and it will help you uh, in terms of being proficient and, and able to handle rightly the Word of God. So, there are several good thing, or things that a, a good study Bible will help you do. The first is, it will include cross-references, so the cross-references are right here. Um, where basically if there are certain texts uh, that, that maybe are mirrored or echoed or similar ideas occur in other texts, it will give those texts to you. So if you're wanting to do a deep dive, you'll know, hey, here's some good text to look at and a good place to start in terms of a deeper study. Cross-references are very helpful, and they, like I said, may include other texts that deal with the same topic or a text that tells a similar story. So, for instance, if you have one story that's in uh, the Gospels, say uh, the story of the feeding of 5,000 that's in each of the four Gospels, the cross-references will tell you where those texts occur in the other Gospels. Um, footnotes. They can also... Uh, they can also be very helpful because they can provide alternative translations or they might give you a more literal translation and it might explain why they did that. 
Also, it might give you a, a hint like right here about what other manuscripts include. Maybe it's an alternative reading or maybe it's saying that the earliest manuscripts didn't include this particular verse. Uh, the footnotes will help you see that and will help you uh, be confident in, in your study and, uh, and just help you further your understanding. And then finally, uh, a good study Bible will have all kinds of different footnotes, and every study Bible is different in how they do this, but it'll give you good footnotes to just explain the text more, maybe provide some historical background or connect some theological dots. And of course, be discerning in what you get. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my own Bible, the CSB. I really like it. There's great... Uh, great study Bibles, the ESV study Bible, the NIV study Bible, lots of good study Bibles, but they can be very helpful as you become a more serious student of God's Word. The next helpful, uh, helpful tool that's out there, uh, as you may already know, are Bible commentaries. And there are many, many, many Bible commentaries, right? And I, I kind of tongue-in-cheek quoted here at the end of Ecclesiastes of the writing of many books, there is no end. Um, but Bible commentaries are basically tools designed to help students and scholars better understand the Bible. They talk about particular issues uh, in terms of uh, interpretive options in, in different books and passages. Uh, they oftentimes give you a bibliography in order to, to know how you can go deeper. Uh, but commentaries come from a variety of perspectives, uh, both Jewish, Christian, secular, liberal, conservative. Uh, and I don't say that as a, a critique, but just to say um, some, like for instance, uh, this is just a, a this picture is, uh, for instance, Genesis 1 through 11 by Claus Vestermann. Uh, Claus Vestermann is going to come at uh, the scripture from a very different perspective than, uh, than evangelical believers, but he has some incredible insights. So you can't write someone off just because you might uh, have a different theological view than they do. They may have some great insights into the scriptures that might really help you, but you just need to be aware what perspective uh, is, is being proposed or, or being uh, presupposed in some cases in the commentary, and then use them accordingly. Use them to help you understand the Bible, and uh, they can be very helpful. So Bible commentaries help provide deeper insight than is possible in a study Bible, uh, whereas in a study Bible you might get a note. Uh, in, in commentaries like this, you have a full-length book that's dealing in-depth with various issues of interpretation. And uh, there's a lot, of good, uh, a lot of good conservative commentaries. I like the New American Commentary series uh, particularly. It's, it's a great go-to for uh, more technical issues. You can think of the uh, uh, New International Commentary of the Old Testament, New International Commentary of the New Testament. There's actually a, a website out there, bestcommentaries.com, that can help you navigate some of these things. But if you ever wonder what commentary should I use for a particular book, ask a pastor or a trusted resource and they can help you. Finally, I want to talk about uh, journal articles, and these are going to be even more technical, even more, uh, even more um, precise in some ways, or even more specific, I should say, uh, in terms of dealing with particular issues in the text. And so journal articles provide detailed exegetical considerations uh, to specific texts. They're dealing with specific issues at a very uh, sometimes technical level, but uh, here's what's important about journal articles is a, a lot of times ideas that original, originate in articles eventually may make their way into mainstream Christian thought. And so as you go deeper into the text, sometimes there might be a very particular issue, and maybe it's a very thorny issue that you say, well, why, why did the translators use this word? Or what, what idea lies behind uh, this translation? Or, or what historical phenomenon is going on that, that's important in understanding this text? Well, there are articles out there uh, that can help you dive deeper into those issues. And so a lot of times, if you say you're at a, a seminary or college environment, there will be, uh, be databases or there will be search engines that are tailored to help you find these. And again, lots of good resources. And I'll just tell you, maybe you're not in seminary or uh, you're not in Bible college, but you can use Google and, uh, and use some of these sources. As with commentaries, they're going to come from a variety of perspectives, uh, but as you go deeper into studying the Word of God, uh, this is really kind of the next step in, in progressing through uh, especially the academic study of the Bible. Uh, but I want to end where we began. As we think about our English Bible, we should be so thankful for uh, all of the many resources that we have as those who speak English. Uh, truly, they came through the, the blood, sweat, and tears of, of many of our brothers and sisters in Christ before us. And so uh, if you have more questions about this, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'd love to talk about it more.
and, uh, and I'll look forward to continuing as we build on this foundation of, of our Bible translations, and, and we'll begin to talk in the future about different principles of interpreting uh, genres in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I'll look forward to diving into that. So God bless you. Thank you so much.